Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are continuing our study of the book of Acts, and we are in Acts chapter 3. And here we see Peter and John doing exactly what Jesus commanded them to do. They're spreading the good news about his kingdom. And they are starting uh, at the beginning of this chapter to walk to the temple. They see a man who has been crippled from birth, carried to the temple gate. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and the man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So Peter and John are just going to church, right? I don't know what it's like at your home and uh, what takes place in the car as you head to church, but it's always a little stressful in our home. One of my kids, I won't say which one, always tries to get out of going. And as a parent, you have this stress of getting everybody ready for church, messing with the kids or saying, oh, you know, my, my spouse isn't helping me, finding out that, oh, we should have done laundry the day before, and then you're running late. In this story, Peter and John are doing what they always do, perhaps walking along the same path, not knowing that today God is going to do something miraculous because God puts something in their path on the way to church. Now, we probably always expect to find God at church, right? That that's where miracles happen. But God interrupts their walk with a man who needs help. One theologian said, so far as the record goes, not one soul was converted in the upper room. We must get out of the upper rooms, out to where the needy are waiting, and give them our witness, the redeeming love and grace and power of Jesus Christ. John Henry Nouwen wrote these words, I sought to hear the voice of God and climbed the topmost steeple, but God declared, go down again, I dwell among the people. Peter and John are going to temple as usual. They're going to worship, they're going to pray, they're going to give their tithes. This might seem ordinary to others, but to the Christian, these are the ordinary things that bring about the extraordinary. They're going to have a visitation by God into their lives. This crippled man could have chosen any place to beg, right? He could have sat in the market. He could have sat along the main road. But he has his friends place him near the gate to the temple. Maybe he had the feeling that, you know, if, if people who serve God or worship God, maybe they'll be more helpful. They'll be more generous to someone like him. The Bible also mentions that this gate is called the beautiful gate. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us this gate is made of Corinthian brass, was plated with gold and silver. It stood 75 feet high and it was 60 feet wide, which means this gate is wide enough that anyone could have ignored him and passed by on the other side. Maybe some would drop a couple of coins into his hand as they came to worship and pray. And who knows, maybe those people had good motives. You know, that we're trying to help out another fellow human being. Perhaps some would see him and give selfishly so that others could see how generous they were. Or perhaps they were hoping that God would take notice of their generosity. But then Peter and John come by. They don't walk around him. They don't drop a few coins in. Peter and John stop. In fact, they look at him. And instead of looking away, they even take time to speak to the man. 
The difference here with Peter and John and all those other worshipers that were going to church that day, Peter and John, they're Jews. They had the same background as anybody else walking through the doors. They had the same knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. They attended temple just like everybody else. They gave their tithes just like everybody else. They spent their time in prayer just like everybody else. So what's the difference? Why did Peter and John stop when no one else would give this man more than a casual glance? The difference, Peter and John were Jesus' disciples. And something happens to you when you listen to Jesus' words. Something happens to you when you obey Jesus' teachings. Jesus was compassionate. He was empathetic. So if you're his disciple and you see people differently, then you understand their hurts. You know their needs. On the outside, Peter and John are ordinary people just like all the others, and they're gathering for worship that day. They're just like every other ordinary person, and that's exactly the kind of person God uses. God uses ordinary people just like you and me. Knowing what the man wanted, Peter and John told the crippled man, hey, we don't have any money to give you, but what we do have is something that money can't buy. They took him by the hand and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And the man was healed. Peter and John are ordinary people, but they were disciples of Jesus. They didn't have any money to give, but what they did have, they were willing to give. They were willing to serve. They were willing to love. They were willing to be used by God to touch other people's lives. What about us? Aren't you just an ordinary person? Sure feels like that way, doesn't it? A lot. There's ministry opportunities around us every day. And most of the time we think to ourselves, I don't have silver or gold to give. In other words, I don't have what other people need. Maybe not. But what do you have? What gifts has God given you? Can you pray? Can you listen? Can you take some time to reach out and touch the life of somebody who needs Jesus? God not only works in ordinary times in our lives, and not only does he work in ordinary people, but he can use all of that ordinary to do miracles. The crippled man thought that his greatest need was just a couple of extra bucks so he could buy bread or meat have something to eat that day. But Peter and John, they looked beyond the surface. They saw somebody that needed something more than money. This man needs Jesus. The beggar asked for a handout, and he got Jesus instead. When Peter told the man to walk in the name of Jesus, the Bible says the disciples took him by the hand and lifted him up. What a wonderful image of what the church should be. We should be in the business of reaching out a hand to those who are lost, to those who are hurting, to those who need Jesus, to give them more than just a hand out. We need to give them a hand up. We can encourage, we can lift up. We can work miracles through the power of Christ. You know, we've been talking about the American church and its decline in numbers. And so they did a survey on some churches who were declining and they found 10 things that were common to them contributing to this, and one of them was evangelistic apathy. Very few members shared their faith on a regular basis. They were more concerned about their own needs rather than the eternal needs of the world or the community in which they lived. The church that stands far away, oblivious to human pain and human need, that's not much of a church, is it? God's plan for the church is to walk right alongside those who are hurting and needy and to hold out the hand and lift them up. Through us, God can lift a broken person to their feet and give them what they need in Christ. This crippled beggar 
not only was he healed in body, he was healed in soul. Acts 3, 8 says he jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. The man who used to sit and beg and ask for a handout is now walking through the gates and the house of worship. That's not what it says. It doesn't say walking. It says he was jumping up and down, praising God for what was done for him. I wonder how many of us feel like dancing and jumping when we walk through our church doors, thankful for the blessing that God gives us. You and I, we've been set free from sin. We, do we grasp just how amazing that is? None of us should walk in here downcast. None of us should want to sit way in the back. None of us should be bothered when somebody raises their hands or somebody else shouts amen. Of course the lame man had reason to jump around and to shout and to praise God. But the thing is, we do too. What do you see next in the story? It says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he, he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. You are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who, you, who has been appointed for you, namely Jesus. You know, a miracle like this, it doesn't just change the people that were involved. Sometimes events are so incredible that they even touch the lives of the people who saw it happen. Sometimes it can even change the lives of people who just hear about it. This healing is one of those kinds of events. I mean, think about it. A man who had been crippled from birth, who's over 40 years old, begging at the temple gates for years, he is healed. Now he has the ability to walk. So as people go about their ordinary routines, they suddenly see this man jumping and running in the temple courts. They're never going to forget this day is a miracle. So it's moments like this, these time-stopping moments, whether it happens in war or sports or romance, this tremendous opportunity arises. It's like the blinders of life fall off for a moment, and we're all so amazed that we dial in and we're all paying attention. Our hearts and minds are shocked, and we want to hear. We want to find out what happened, find out how it happened. And the people who do these things, who we watch make these things take place, they become famous. If they're successful, then we want to be successful just like them. If they're rich, then we want to be rich just like them. Unfortunately, we often turn these heroes into idols. We buy their baseball cards, we read their books, we seek their autographs, we treat their words as law. And the more someone becomes famous, the more we listen to them. And we say, please, tell us again. How were you able to dig deep? How were you able to pull out that victory? How were you able to save that damsel in distress? I think gone are the days when kids wanted to be doctors and policemen. Now they want to be athletes and musicians that go on world tour or some famous YouTube celebrity. And re the reality is all of us, really all of us, have this selfish magnet in us that makes us want other people to look to us to pay attention to us, to listen to the things that we have to say. But the opposite is also true. We don't like it when we are not recognized or when we're not thanked for the job that we're done. We get irritated if someone doesn't say thank you or pat us on the back. But we sure do love when people constantly tell us what great people we are, 
and how much we mean to them, we can be very self-centered people. When Peter heals the lame man, Luke says that the crowd was filled with wonder and amazement at what happened. And then the people started to stare at them as if by their own power or their own godliness, they made the man walk. It's one of those moments where everybody stops what they're doing and they all want to hear the story. What's the latest? How did this happen? Peter had them eating out of his hands. So what does Peter do in this instance? What does he say? He doesn't say, ah, no, it, it was nothing. You know, it's really all in a day's work. I mean, when you believe like I believe, things happen. No. First of all, I don't think Peter would ever draw focus to himself. Instead, notice that Peter gives a very clear testimony as to how the miracle takes place. Peter immediately deflects, right? It's the first thing he says. It wasn't us. He said, it wasn't us. It was Jesus. And then with great detail, Peter said that Jesus was raised from the dead and he glorifies God. Peter calls him the righteous one and the author of life. He says, you want to know who did this? It was Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He's the author of life. He is not dead. He's alive. He's in glory. He's in heaven. And that's who did it. Peter takes no fame, no thanks, no praise, no pats on the back. Instead of pointing people to himself, Peter points to Christ. I always admire the celebrity or the athlete who takes the trophy and says, first, I need to thank God. Opportunities like that don't come very often. The people that actually look up and are, who are willing to say, it wasn't me, this came from God. Those are beautiful moments. We can take those same moments too. Those same moments still come to us. They, they don't come by very often, but there'll be moments when people will look up to you. People who are in a moment willing to listen to something that you have to say, they, they come. Maybe it's when you're tucking your child into bed you know, and they say, they have, they have some question about God. Maybe it's a patient that you're working with at the hospital or a friend who's sitting across the table at lunch and just out of the blue, they say, hey, do you believe in life after death? Maybe it's a neighbor who's going through a death in the family and they know that you're a religious person. And they, they ask you, how come you're always so positive? How come you're always so upbeat? You know, once in a while in life, the, the blinders fall off of people and they will turn and look at you for answers. And it's at that time that you have the opportunity to say something that's worthwhile. When Esther, who was a Jew, was chosen by Xerxes to be the queen, she was put in a very awkward situation. Her people were going to be wiped out by an evil man. And Esther was terrified of talking to the king without her permission. But her godparent told her, who knows that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this? She was reminded to take advantage of the situation. And as the disciples of Jesus, we should think about the opportunities that come our way. Peter uses this opportunity to share Christ. Peter also notices how um, Christ is presented here. I mean, if we really examine what he's saying, Peter's approach is very scary, <laughs> right? Because he takes the gloves off. He, he comes out swinging. I, I think today we might be tempted to soften the blow or begin with love, right? But Peter begins with sin. He says, you had him killed. You disowned him before Pilate. You had a murderer set free. You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. Peter starts with sin. Peter starts with the thing that separates us from God. Peter starts with the problem. How can you convince people that Jesus is the cure if they don't know what the problem is? 
Jesus fixes us. So we have to be aware that we need fixing. Have you ever looked down at something you broke? You broke it, right? Probably by accident. Maybe it's a mug. Maybe it's your dad's favorite chair or, you know, you got into a fender bender on the road. There's something about staring at something broken that makes you ask, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to make this right? Can you imagine a crowd of people thinking, oh my, we killed the author of life. What can we do to fix this? The good news is Peter doesn't leave them hanging. He tells them how to fix it. He says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That's the only way you can fill a jar, right? You can't fill a jar until it's empty. You need to empty it first. Peter was trying to shake this crowd up to convince them that they needed Christ. And as long as these people were full of excuses or self-righteousness, they didn't need Christ. But if they could be brought to their knees, if they could be made to see that they need God's grace, that they need his mercy, that their sins could be wiped out, and he says, and then times of refreshing will come. I wonder how many opportunities I've had to share the gospel and I've wasted it because I felt ill-equipped, I felt scared, or simply because I felt ordinary. And I thought to myself, I don't have silver or gold. Did you like the graphic that we had on the screen? You can have it right now on your phone. It's true. You just go to your phone store and download Life on Mission. Life on Mission, it will give you those three circle graphics and allow you to read each step so that you can begin to share your faith with your friends. Next time you're in church, I want you to look around. I want you to look around at all the empty seats. Every single one of those empty seats is a friend or a neighbor that needs to know about our comfort and our hope when they lose a job, when they experience something in life that makes them stop and seek answers, you have the truth. You can't just keep working and accumulating possessions and living like there's no author of life. You can't continue to just have sex with whomever you please and think to yourself, I'm gonna get away with it. You can't disown God with your vulgar language and think that he'll turn a deaf ear to it. You can't keep killing people with your words. If you continue to think that life revolves around you, you will stay a cripple. If you keep ignoring God and trusting in money or trusting in government to make you happy, you will pay a terrible price. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. He cannot be contained. He is still in power and he is coming again to judge the world. But if you realize what you're doing and you turn to God instead, trusting in him for forgiveness, the Bible says times of refreshing will come. The basic sense of that word, refreshing, it's the thought of that you're going to cool something with your breath. You're going to dry something out. You know, like what medicine does. That's what medicine does to a wound. That's why you want a wound sometimes to uh, experience fresh air. You take the bandage off and it reveals how ugly your sin is. But once you expose your wound and your sinful scars to God, that cool air of God's forgiveness begins healing. When people ask for answers, they need to know that there is still hope, that there is still forgiveness, and that it happens through the death and the resurrection of Christ. It may take some time, but those long scars of guilt 
and shame that your friends have, they will eventually heal over. They need to know that by taking their guilt to the cross, they will experience the life and forgiveness and hope that is only available through the blood of Christ. The question is, do you have friends and neighbors that you love this much? Or would you rather keep your relationship with your friends and family just on the surface? Where you just both agree about cars and sports and you don't ever address the spiritual weakness that exists or the need for forgiveness. Peter took a chance that day. He really took a risk and he accused them. You killed the author of life. He took a chance when he said, you know, you, you killed Jesus, but you can't contain hope. We need to take a risk. It is time for the American church to take a risk. The future of the church, the future of your friends and family is you sharing the gospel. When the next opportunity comes, let people know about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we are living in a time of decline. We are living in a time when the message is getting watered down. The Holy Spirit and your word are still true and they continue to point to evangelism and discipleship as the way to save your church. So today we come to you in prayer for your church. May there be less programs and less discussion about finances. And may there be more discussion about evangelism and discipleship. We pray the primary focus of all Christian churches is to point the lost to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Please give these churches the heart of evangelism. Give all of us eyes to see the lost and to bring them to you. Let us not forget the duty of your church is to win souls. Lord, we pray that we continue to grow new and more mature. We pray for the empowerment and boldness of all believers. Amen. Well, we would just remind you that you are welcome here anytime. Our doors are open, not just on Sunday. We're here six days a week. And we would love to be the church where you live, to minister to you and to feed your soul. If you have questions about salvation, if you have questions about Jesus or his atoning blood, please don't hesitate to call or come by anytime. We have two services available to you on Sunday, and they're completely different. Our 9.30 service is traditional. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to receive communion. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. Our second service is, ha is done with a worship team. Please come casual. Come however you feel most comfortable and bring your family. Bring your children. We have a program from birth all the way through high school. In between those two hours, we have coffee and donuts. We would love for you to come and fellowship and meet the other members here. And we'll see you next Sunday. Bye.